So before we start, we gotta get our terms right. Portable is not very useful here, and as a point of functionality, it's a given. You wouldn't call a PS1 a portable console because it comes with a screen, or a GameCube even though it has a handle for easy transfer. Handheld covers the more important point. It's all in one, in your hands. The primary mode of play is available to you, wherever you are, and it has the capability to power itself. Another distinction that might cause a little trouble, but I feel like I need to make, is that I believe the software matters in this too. Handheld games are designed with the console in mind. Ports, of course, are allowed, but primarily, the games would be designed for shorter time frames, or unique ones, and offer the player ability to put down the game rather quickly. This can be in frequent saves, or some kind of hardware suspension mode, and of course, we're not going to count things like Tiger Electronics. Those are basically just hardware. Now that we have our terms set, let's look at some good and bad examples of handheld devices in the past. The 3DS, in my opinion, is the greatest of all time. It wasn't the 3D or the touchscreen, backwards compatibility, camera and AR features, legacy retro games, or the awesome first party titles. It did something that made it part of my daily life. It communicated with other systems, independently, and to my benefit. I'm talking about Street Pass. Almost every game offered some kind of reward via Street Pass, and that made me want to take my 3DS everywhere. Places like conventions or the mall were a goldmine for the Street Pass hits and gave you an extra incentive to play on the go. The console knew it was a handheld and took advantage of it. That kind of ingenuity is something that we are lacking currently. The best example of a use case for this feature is probably Animal Crossing New Leaf. Not only was it an already wildly popular game, but by its very own popularity, the players benefited. I was finding furniture and decorations from other people's homes that I had not found yet, and I was making connections with people from all around the world in different ways, seeing things that they could get in their region that I couldn't get in mine. Now on to the negative. But Nintendo is up to bat again. Now, I swear, I really like the Switch. Two of my games of the year last year were Switch titles, and I play it often, but it just doesn't hold up to the 3DS when it comes to the handheld department. To be blunt, we really did just get a tablet with interesting controllers. Controllers that are mostly underutilized on most software. Uh, the touchscreen is basically unused. The HD rumble was an incredible feature that was just ignored and even left out of the cheaper model, so it's a testament to its application, I guess. Something that really stands out in the last generation of handhelds was their awareness of the surroundings. Pedometers, GPS, local wireless networks that communicated passively. The software worked in tandem with the hardware in a way you just don't see in home consoles or the Switch. Does being able to play The Witcher on the go really enhance the experience and make it worth the price tag? For some it does, but we leave behind a history of innovation and in pushing what a game console could be. Your handheld had to compete for your attention out in the real world and complement your life. Now it's just what you can do at home, in your pocket? Not really, it doesn't fit in your pocket. In your bag? Alright, sure. It's fine, it's just not unique. It's a missed opportunity. But if we head back to the positive side, I think we need to take a look at the PS Vita. Personally, I love this handheld, as it doesn't compromise much. It's powerful with a beautiful OLED screen, it has a library of retro titles available to it, and plenty of games that take advantage of the touchscreen, accelerometer, and rear touchpad. And I don't think Sony gets enough credit for this, but the handheld felt like a space for experimentation with games like Gravity Rush and Tearaway, and followed the lead of its predecessor, the PSP, in that way. But it's also really sweet to have almost every major Final Fantasy and Metal Gear Solid game on one device, and also share those purchases between that and my home console on TV. To me, the Vita was the best of both worlds, but maybe abandoned or forgotten too soon. Although I hear there are rumors of another Sony handheld in development, I can only hope for a push into innovation and of course, more Astrobot. God, I love that little dude, he's so cool. He's just the best. I mean, look at him. Look at that face. Look at him. Come on. That guy. So the next two, I'm covering mostly together because I feel like they belong in their own category. They really pushed the limits on what I would consider portable, 
mostly due to their size. Um, so let's just jump into it. The first one has to be the Steam Deck. I've held one before and while it didn't weigh a ton, it was something I wouldn't likely take out on the subway and play during my commute. I would need to carry more than my usual travel bag just to house it, and the benefits of that is, well I have a PC with a controller all in one and I can play all my PC games, which is cool, sure, but for something as wide as a MacBook, well frankly the responsible adult in me, wherever he is, would say that I should get more work done on the laptop rather than play a laptop sized gaming device. The second is special because it's still somewhat unique, and that one is of course the Sega Nomad. It's literally just a portable Sega Genesis where you put in the very same cards that you had on your home console and just take it with you. Now it took six, six AA batteries and lasted only four hours, but overall it was technically impressive if not immense. And I really gotta stress this battery thing because I remember even with just my Game Boy Pocket just scrounging pennies to get more and more batteries to, you know, play more Pokemon was a pain. I can't imagine asking my parents for six. Did they even come in packs of six back then? Just wild. Anyways, I can't say that these two are, you know, systems showing the best of what handhelds have to offer, but we do have to take note of them, and I think it's important that, you know, we put them into part of the equation as we look forward into the future. That, and of course, all the Gabe Newell fanboys would freak out if I didn't at least mention the behemoth, you know. They're like that. So let's look off into the future. Eventually, Nintendo's gonna have to come out with another system and address this need. Sony seems to be maybe doing the same, and the Steam Deck is gonna get some kind of follow-up, right? So what would I want to see from all this? First, of course, it needs to build off the foundations we already have. So internet capable, you know, that's a given. Um, but hopefully something that can passively communicate with other like systems. But honestly, where I think the real opportunity is, is in competition with the one machine that we all have and is basically running our lives, our phones. Our phones have a strong monopoly on our attention. The next handhelds have to give us a good reason to ignore that addiction machine. And I think they can by making themselves useful in more ways than one, mirroring kind of the PSP actually. Looking back, it's incredible that it was an all-in-one music, movie, game, photo, and camera device with internet access, an online shop, and GPS. That was in 2004. That was 20 years ago. But at the same time, on the Nintendo DS, we had PictoChat and Nintendogs that were crazy popular. We had grandparents playing Brain Age, and museums were using the console as a device to guide their patrons through their halls. So I think we need a bit of both. We need a platform where I can play fun games, but also has functionality that ties into my daily life. Like a pedometer is kind of a must now. And rewarding steps in games would be awesome like they did on the 3DS, giving you a kind of special system level currency you can use in your games. As well as maybe some kind of PDF reader, you know, to help people read their comics or their books on the go. Uh, and, you know, I hate to say this, you know, for better or worse, I think access to social media would keep people on their, you know, gaming device much more than on their phones. If the software can somehow interact with us and find that balance between interesting gameplay with unique hardware and, you know, kind of facilitate that kind of ingenuity that we saw on the DS, 3DS, and the PSP, then that's the winning strategy. Simply saying, I can play Zelda now in my car, it, it's just not enough. Is this too idealistic? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but looking back, it's clear that handhelds were also a testing ground for new ideas, innovative tech on both the hardware and the software. Motion control was first tested on the Game Boy with Kirby's Tilt and Tumble, IR data transfer on the carts of Pokemon games on the GBA, touchscreens on the DS and the 3D that didn't require glasses, only gave me a mild headache. I mean. Come on, it's obvious that as we move forward, handhelds were kind of leading the way. I was recruiting soldiers from MAC addresses in Metal Gear Portable Ops on my PSP. That was crazy. As I said in my last video, the hybrid solution just isn't enough anymore. And it's been seven years since the Switch. And almost 30 years since the Nomad. Give me a reason to bring the device along the right size and I'm in. Or honestly, you know, just give me the Game Boy Classic and I'll be happy. It just has to have like Resident Evil Gaiden and, um, you know, Metal Gear Ghost Babble and I'm in, dude. 
And if you don't do it, I'm going to buy that silly, tiny Game Gear and I'll prove you all wrong. Size matters. It does. Alright, so what kind of things would you want to see from the handhelds in the next generation? Let us know in the comments. Thanks for sticking around, of course. And be sure to subscribe for our next video. We'll be doing a bit of time traveling to see what innovative tech affected game design at the turn of the millennium and how it can affect future games. See you then.